this video starts on a white screen. The Microsoft logo appears. The screen fades to black. A green background featuring the letters A and I appears, followed by a slideshow showcasing new technologies. AI for Accessibility is a Microsoft program committed to influencing the future of technology to empower people living with disabilities. Whether reimagining the future of accessible education, building experiences that are accessible for people of all abilities, or developing AI-powered technology to make the world more inclusive, we are pushing the limits of what AI can do. Screen fades to black, a speaker appears. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to talk about low-cost assistive technology. And to start us off, why is low-cost assistive technology important? So back in April last year, as part of our five-year strategy, accessibility strategy, one of the things that we had realized was we wanted to make sure that more and more people in low- and middle-income countries have access to assistive technology because when we think about people with disabilities, a large number of people with disabilities live in these countries and don't have access to assistive technology. And so how do we make sure that, that you know, people with disabilities in these countries have access and they're able to meaningfully use it and, and in doing so, meaningfully contribute to the economy? That is sort of what you know, our core priority and a crucial part of our five-year strategy was that we announced last year. And to actually see how we can make that a reality, we decided that we are going to be investing in low-cost assistive technology, um, both in terms of funding, but also seeing how we can try to understand some of the systemic issues and how we can go after that, working with others working in this space. Um, and so we did a lot of talking, a lot of research, talking to people with disabilities in these countries, uh, entrepreneurs and innovators, governments, uh, nonprofits, etc. And essentially, there are key uh, three key things that we found. Um, the first one was the cost itself and the, and the access to hardware. How do we make sure that we can bring down the prices, but also how do we make sure that there is a clear way in which people with disabilities can access and get this, uh, procure this hardware? Uh, because one of the things that we realized was that the distribution and the whole market was very fragmented. Uh, and also, there was a lot of challenge in terms of the entire uh, cycle of upgrades and maintenance and all that kind of stuff. So how do we make sure that we can tackle and handle the entire cycle is something that was key. The second aspect of it was software and the AT itself. How do we make sure that that is localized for use in these regions and countries? How do we make sure that there is compatibility where software are not being designed to be run on high-end devices, but also on low configuration devices, such as, for example, the very simple audio players, solar powered audio players. How do we make sure that software um, are taking into account the critical differences in the infrastructure and environment in many of these countries was something that was key as part of this as well. And finally, which is very critical as well, is onboarding awareness and how do we start to create an ecosystem that can further innovators to innovate and also eventually deploy their solutions at scale. And so this includes creating awareness about the most relevant assistive technology for people with disabilities, uh, while also ensuring that, again, there is awareness around how do you actually get support when you need it? How do you actually use that device effectively and ask for help when you need help? And then how do you interact with innovation and entrepreneurs to share your feedback so that there's a closed loop wherein they can take your feedback and improve the product and, and in doing so you know AT can be uh, improved and made better and at the same time how can we create an ecosystem for these entrepreneurs so that they have all the support that they need both in terms of sustainability but also in terms of distribution and wide adoption of their technologies and solutions by people with disabilities in these countries so these are some of the key things that we found based on which we launched a request for proposal or an rfp for the low-cost at funding round um, and um, encourage innovation on these three key areas which leads us to Vembi and the work that you are doing in uh, in the field. Would you mind telling us more about, first of all, who is Vembi and what is your project and the body of work that you're going to take on about? Hi, I'm Vidya and uh, I am one of the co-founders of Vembi Technologies. So at Vembi Technologies, we create affordable assistive technologies for people with visual impairments. And our first product is the uh, Antara Hexis solution. And uh, Antara Hexis solution will cater to the educational needs of a visually impaired 
student by not only giving um, the device, which is a refreshable Braille display, display, which is one of the most affordable Braille display. Along with that, we also give content and cater to the school workflow. So it is a holistic uh, solution, which will very well integrate with the school workflow. Uh, so Wimby is a, a startup uh, founded around two years back in uh, Bangalore, India. So as we were studying, we focus on uh, affordable assistive technologies for visually impaired. And uh, the first product is Hexisatra, which uh, we are working on and for which we have uh, you know, applied for the grant, you know, a Microsoft grant. So it's a basically a 14 cell uh, uh, braille display, uh, which is uh, based on a battery power. It doesn't need a, uh, internet to work uh, for its uh, functioning. And uh, it is designed for ground up for a country like India, where, you know, where you have a, a different kind of requirements and needs compared to a Western country, whether it in terms of maintenance or the low cost and uh, those are the uh, uh, considerations which you have taken into account while you are designing this product. And Antara is a, a content management software which is used to create content for the school children. And um, uh, we look forward to taking this product into market. And uh, uh, presently we are piloting with around 45 children across four states of India and uh, 10 schools. And uh, we look forward to taking this product in much more states and much more schools across India, both special schools as well as inclusive schools. One of the things I have learned from this team um, is the fact that Braille is um, incredibly important, especially for children to learn and to develop the skills um, when it comes to reading Braille. Can you tell us more about why that is important and um, how that is also a factor of independence later in life? Yeah, I think uh, now we are talking about a lot of technologies, a lot of technology advancement. We have uh, screen readers, we have, um, you know, we can even listen to audio, which is pre-recorded very easily these days because of DAISY and other formats. Though there are all these advancements in technology, Braille is indispensable. You need to learn Braille uh, because of so many reasons. So what we see in children who learn Braille, firstly, they are more confident in terms of uh, their spelling and reading and comprehension uh, and punctuations and all of these, which don't get developed automatically when you use, say, JAWS or NVDA for typing when you are very young, because it just goes on reading and you have no idea where to put punctuation mark, where to put comma or full stop and all of these. And also spellings, the more you listen, the weaker your spellings will be. And a lot a lot of people in the visually impaired community also say that, you know, just like how a sighted child goes to school, he or she doesn't take a computer or phone and start typing. So you love to take pen and paper and start writing. And also when you read, that gives different kind of joy than reading directly from the monitor. The same thing applies to a person with visual impairment. So when you begin reading, it gives you the feel of reading when you touch with your fingers and read. So not only that, even for interpreting complex uh, tactile diagrams while you want to study STEM related courses in the higher grades, if you start reading Braille when you are young, your tactile skills will be much more developed so that interpreting tactile diagrams or touch and feel will be much more easier. There are people who have successfully done uh, all their coursework and everything through technology, but definitely learning Braille gives all of these additional advantages. And we see that a lot of people, even in the US and developed countries where there are a lot of technologies have gone on to do their full math graduation and everything using pure Braille Nemet for the obvious reasons that were already mentioned. Yeah, like Vidya uh, covered most of the points. Uh, there is one more point which has come out through many studies in uh, US and other countries. Uh, the people who are proficient in brain are more gainfully employed and more independent and uh, you know uh, are contributing more purposefully to the society. This has been uh, found in many uh, studies. So knowledge of Braille uh, not only helps in uh, vocabulary and spelling and uh, uh, you know understanding of the language, but it also helps in the future prospects of the child as the child grows up and pursues other prospects in life.
if you were to give advice to our audience or homework to our audience, um, if they were curious to learn more about assistive technology and especially for blind and low vision people, what advice would you have for them and what homework would you give them? So one of the key things is irrespective of where you are at, uh, you know, as a user or a developer of assistive technology, it is important that we go through the nonprofits uh, in low and middle income countries uh, and a lot of the innovation that is happening here that accounts for specific circumstances uh, in these countries to understand how can we start to develop assistive technology uh, more in, in a more affordable way, more universally, and how do we start to incorporate these unique circumstances, these unique differences from the get-go so that we don't really have to reinvent the wheel and we don't really have to develop assistive technologies uh, you know, differently uh, for these regions. So that is something that I think is key. Having said that, I also do think that while there's a lot of innovation happening, which is amazing to see, one of the aspects that continues to be a key priority for us here at Microsoft is how do we start to ensure that there is a seamless process through which a user, irrespective of where they're at, irrespective of their disability, can find the most uh, relevant assistive technology for them and figure out a very seamless way to procure it, uh, get instructions on how they can be onboarded and, and eventually uh, get upgrades as needed. So that entire process is what we want to make seamless and continues to be a priority for us. So what I feel is when we're talking about assistive technology, it's not only people with visual impairments who will be developing or people with disabilities who will be developing assistive technologies for themselves. So there'll be a, a lot of other people also very much interested in this space. So what I see is a lot of people are simply not aware of what kind of assistive technologies are needed. Though the intentions are really good, they want to help the community, but most people do not know what the community needs. So firstly, I feel that you need to try out technology, so assistive technology solutions yourself, like. There are some of the free screen readers, say like NVDA or even every uh, phone these days has an inbuilt screen reader. So maybe some of these can be tried out because I remember that one of my friends told me in, in one of the hackathons, the theme was to develop assistive technologies for people with visual impairments and about 100 teams had participated. And out of the 180 teams had developed something to do with a cane where uh, you know a, a visually impaired people uh, a visually impaired person can take their phone app or um, something of that sort and uh, navigate indoors or even move around and it will detect obstacles so we don't only use canes or you know navigational devices there's much more that is needed so first step is to create awareness and secondly i feel when talking about organization like ours and country like India, a lot of people are working in this space, but what needs to happen is, you know, everyone shouldn't be working in silos. There needs to be a lot of collaboration to make education more inclusive so that we can achieve what we are set to do collectively than doing it individually. These are the two things I feel about assistive technology. So when we talk about assistive technologies, uh, one of the things we have to remember is that uh, we should not rush technology into the community. Like, you know, many times uh, we need to spend a lot of time with the community to understand the real stated, unstated needs. Uh, in many times, uh, you know, uh, people feel like there's a technology is very powerful. So let's apply the technology to come up with a quick prototype, but they don't uh, become products because they have not been take designed or, you know, uh, spend time with the users to understand the real requirements and many times the products may not be uh, meeting the real needs and real requirements rather than it is trying to uh, be more like a fancy feature which the user may not be needing. So that is what uh, we are seeing. Many prototypes are built but they are not taken into a product which are not wanted by the community because they were never asked, they were never uh, you know, uh, designed for the what is the real need. The second thing we have to consider is that basically we should not take a stand of uh, do away with whatever you are doing and follow the new technology. So that cannot be an approach. Uh, go and tell a user, you know, you are doing this. Like for example, she talked about the smart cane. The cane will be continued to be used. We cannot say uh, come up with a new device which will replace the cane. So we need to work with the existing solution and build on. Uh, that's the only way a user will, uh, you know, uh, be comfortable uh, moving to a new technology. 
so we should not come up with the technology forward uh, approach to problem but it should be basically the users needs and that should be the uh, main driver of the uh, design of the products if that is taken care and the community uh, inputs are taken care and uh, we really design you know you know uh, freeze the requirement based on the community's inputs i am fairly certain that the products which are designed will have a, a good acceptance in the market Thank you so much for the conversation today. Um, it was an incredible learning on my side and thank you everybody for tuning in and let's continue to close the disability divide.